Thanks for joining us in our encounter to, in our journey rather, to encounter God, to encourage one another, and to engage our world. We're in a journey through the book of Acts, and we are about midway through. We're a little more than midway through. We're on Acts chapter 15 this morning. Remember, chapter 1 of Acts was the promise, the introduction, the promise to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Remember back in Matthew 28, Jesus gave his disciples the great commission, go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples. The primary command there is not go. The primary command is make disciples. In your going, make disciples. But then he says in Acts 1, but wait. Don't go in your own strength. Wait until you receive the gift that the Father is going to send you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth or to the ends of the earth. And that laid the roadmap for the entire book of Acts. We see chapters 2 to 7 is the Jerusalem section. We see the promise fulfilled in the giving of the Spirit in chapter 2. And then the outworking of that outpouring in and through the lives of his disciples as they followed his leading. That's chapters 2 through 7 is the Jerusalem section. Chapters 8 through 12 is the Judea and Samaria section. And a couple of weeks ago, we turned the corner toward the ends of the earth in chapter 13 as the gospel is being promulgated throughout the known world. And this morning, we find ourselves in Acts chapter 15. We begin here in a church that we saw a few chapters back in Antioch, chapter 15, verse 1. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch where, and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem. That phrase, up to Jerusalem, does that mean uh, that Antioch is south of Jerusalem? No. Everything was, when you went to Jerusalem, you always went up, because it's speaking of, it always refers to it in elevation. Uh, Jerusalem was one of the highest cities, and so you always went up to Jerusalem. It's not a reference to north or south. Um, so Paul and Barnabas were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Then the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Paul, Barnabas and Paul. So who was the first speaker? Peter. Peter was first speaking. Now he passes the baton. Now Barnabas and Paul get up. They listen to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders that God had done among, had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. 
Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written, After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the giving of your eternal word. And we thank you for the promise that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. And Lord, I pray that your word would have your way in my heart and in my life and in our fellowship this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So the church in Antioch, we remember that from a few chapters back. This is the first place where the disciples are called Christians, where they took on that mantle and that label gladly. Yes, you want to call us followers of Christ, little Christs? Okay, that's who we're supposed to be anyway as we allow his life, his spirit, his character to be lived in us and through us. It is at this church some men came down from Judea and start uh, teaching them that they must be circumcised in order to be truly saved. You say, what a strange teaching is this? So, certainly foreign to our ears in our culture today. What does that have to do with anything? But remember, uh, the early church was considered a Jewish sect at the beginning. And as it spread throughout the known world into non-Jewish peoples, the question arose, do non-Jews have to become Jewish before they can become a follower of Christ? Right? This was really the crux of the issue. Do they have to convert to Judaism and then convert to Christ? Circumcision was a sign, you'll remember, for God's covenant people since Abraham, way back in Genesis chapter 17. And circumcision came to be seen as the symbol or the embodiment of all of the Mosaic law. So when these brothers from Judea came to Antioch and said, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised according to the law of Moses, they weren't just prescribing a surgical procedure. Just have the surgery and then you're good. That's not the implication, right? They're saying... They're really implying, unless you take on the full weight of all of the Mosaic law, both the moral law, like the Ten Commandments, and the whole of the ceremonial, ritual, and dietary laws as well, then you can't be saved. How do we know they were implying all of that? Well, look at verse 5, because they said that. <laughs> the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Right? They meant the whole kit and caboodle, not just the procedure. Now, this is, a, this is an element that was, um, that was spreading in various areas in the early church, and Paul deals with it directly in the book of Galatians. We'll actually touch on that a little bit next week as we go into ver uh, chapter 16. But Paul deals very sharply with, with this issue of Judaizers, people who re wanted to require new Gentile believers to convert to Judaism and all that that entailed before they could be considered saved in Christ. So that's a little bit of the background. When he's saying circumcision, it, does, it doesn't just mean the surgical procedure. It means all of the law of Moses. Verse 6. 5, rather. 
Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, I was debating last night whether I was going to insert this parenthetical, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, (laughs) Against my better judgment. No. Some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. Is that a funny phrase? Some of the believers, so they're Christians, who belong to the party of the Pharisees. Can I just suggest to you this morning, if you as a believer are more identified by your party membership than you are with the person of Christ, there's something out of balance. Of all of the people who could have been walking around Paul himself is here, right? The Pharisee of Pharisees. He could have been walking around declaring his affiliation to the Pharisees, but he doesn't do that. He did nothing but declare his ultimate affiliation to the person and purposes of Jesus Christ. Paul did not walk around declaring his affiliation with the party of the Pharisees. And I'm, afraid, I, I'm just afraid that so many of us in so many areas of life are far more concerned about our party affiliation than we are about the person of Christ. And whether that's political or it's religious segments of belief or whether it's Ford versus Chevy, I mean, I don't care what it is. Like, some of us are more willing to die about arguments with other believers about minor doctrinal differences, then we are willing to pour out our lives so that the lost can come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And there's something out of balance when my name is associated with, you know, Sean, that believer who's a member of the party of fill-in-the-blank, right? Something's out of balance. Verse 6. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. There really are some topics that require long, thoughtful, prayerful, and spirited discussions among the family of God and among church leadership. And it's a responsible leadership team who takes on such issues and who puts in the time and energy required to seek the Lord and the Lord's leading on specific issues. I just got to tell you, I'm delighted to have served in this last couple of years with five elders here at Millard Alliance who are willing to spend time digging into Scripture and to spend countless hours in prayer and discussion around aspects of life and ministry in our fellowship. I'll be sharing a little bit more with you next week about some of those conversations that we have been having in the last 12 months and the direction that we've come to. But just understand, here in our text today, as we see Peter's declaration and Paul and Barnabas's demonstrations and then James's final decision, All of those things were not spur-of-the-moment decisions with these men. They weren't made on a whim. They were laid in the foundations of prayer, seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and great consideration and discussion. I truly appreciate the fact that we here at Millard Alliance have elders who are willing to do the same. So continue to pray for your elders. And as we go into our, our annual meeting on the 7th of February, pray for, for that, um, that confirmation vote for the next cycle of elders as we go into this next couple of years and this next season that the Lord is leading us into. Okay, Peter's declaration, beginning in verse 7. After much discussion... Peter got up. Now, that phrase should shock us a little bit, knowing who Peter is, 
Did anything that Peter did throughout the Gospels happen after much discussion? (laughs) Did it? No. Like Peter was this hot-headed, in the moment, whatever comes to mind, I'm just going to do it. Ah, that's never going to happen, Jesus. I'll never deny, right? Like Peter is always just flaring up. But here we see a, a growth pattern in Peter's life, right? After much discussion. That's a big phrase for Peter. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and and them. Boy, if I could uh, popularize any motto, I think every church in the world should put this one on a plaque somewhere. No distinction between us and them. No distinction between us and them. And every individual follower of Christ should have like in our rear view mirror in the car, right? Like no distinction between me and thee. <laughs> or in, you got heads-up display on your new Google glasses or whatever. Like, can you put it right there? No distinction between us and them, between me and thee. Now, this does not mean that everything is relative and my truth is my truth and it's just as valid as your truth and they're equally valid even though they're completely diametrically opposed with one another. That's not what this phrase means. What Peter means here, and what we should mean when we say this phrase, is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We must all be saved the same way, by grace, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And the same Holy Spirit which raised Christ Jesus from the dead is the same Holy Spirit of God that empowers Gentile believers throughout the book of Acts and throughout history and is the same Holy Spirit who desires to fill you and empower you to live the life he's calling you to live. There's no distinction between us and them. For the record, uh, for us here in Omaha, Nebraska, in the, the Midwest of the United States, historically speaking, if you ever ask yourself, uh, where would I put myself in this passage? Uh, we're the them in this passage. We're not the us, right? Peter says there's no distinction between us and them. He's referring to Gentiles. We're the them. We're not the us. We're the them. We're the Gentiles who have been grafted in to Abraham's family like the wild olive tree grafted in, contrary to nature, like Paul says in Romans, to to a cultivated olive tree. Paul Paul describes that in uh, Romans 11. He mirrors exactly, Paul mirrors in Romans 10, exactly what Peter is saying here. In Romans 10, 12, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's Paul. Mirroring exactly what Peter is saying. Isn't it great? I love this chapter in Acts because we see Peter and Barnabas and Paul and James all in lockstep. They are on the same page at this Jerusalem council. They know what God has done and continues to do in the Gentile world and they are not backing down to religious bullies. So keep in mind, when we say the phrase, there's no distinction between us and them, we're actually the them (laughs) in the Gentile world, and we have been graciously welcomed into God's family. 
Amen? That's Peter's declaration. And then we see Paul and Barnabas. This is interesting um, because when we usually think of Paul, we think of him as very uh, doctrinally thick, deep, verbose, right? Lots of words coming from Paul. But what is Paul and Barnabas, what is their testimony at this council? The power of God demonstrated among the Gentiles. He's not preaching a doctrinal sermon. He's giving a demonstration of the power of God through the Holy Spirit. Telling about the miraculous signs and wonders that God had done among the Gentiles through them. God ratified the life transformational message of the gospel into the Gentile world. This declaration of, hey, there is a new and higher kingdom and there's a new king on the throne. It's not Caesar. (laughs) Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. And he's ratifying this life transformational message of the gospel by the powerful works of the Holy Spirit in and through the lives of his people. And then James. James makes a decision. Jump down to verse 19. It is my judgment, therefore. So James here, this is James, the brother, half-brother of Jesus, who not too long ago, in, as we saw in the Gospel of John, was among Jesus' family who didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, thought he was kind of nuts, right? And so now, post-crucifixion, post-resurrection, James himself has come to faith, and not only faith, he's come to prominent leadership uh, in the Jerusalem church, is... Um, And this indication here, it is my judgment, therefore, seems to indicate that James was the head of this Jerusalem council and perhaps the head of the Jerusalem church at this time. So it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Don't make it difficult. Isaiah uh, chapter 8 in verse 14 speaks of the Messiah to come as the stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Isn't that a funny moniker to put over the Messiah to come? Jesus is going to be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Turn with me there, would you? Isaiah chapter 8. Someone removed Isaiah from my Bible. Isaiah chapter 8. I think we've got time to hit this today. Isaiah chapter 8, beginning in verse 11. The Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. Do not call conspiracy everything these people call conspiracy. Poignant verse for our day, perhaps. Do not fear what they fear, and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread, and he will be a sanctuary both for both houses of Israel And he will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare 
Many of them will stumble and will fall and be broken, and they will be snared and captured. Bind up the testimony and seal up, uh, and seal up the law among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Isaiah speaks of this Messiah to come as a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And that is intentional. We're supposed to trip over Jesus. That's the point. Jesus is intending to mess up your plans because he has better plans for you. We're supposed to trip over Jesus. That's why we try our best to communicate the gospel clearly in worship and in the word in language and in ways that you can understand that speak to your heart in your heart language because I don't want you to trip over the delivery or the packaging around the message. I want you to trip over Jesus and I want you to find your new identity in him. Not in some person or in some form or in some way or some distraction that keeps your focus off of the person. Of, I want you to trip over Jesus and find your new identity in him. And I think that's what James is really saying here in his decision. Don't make it difficult for the Gentiles returning to God. Don't put all of these other stumbling blocks in their way so they, they trip over all these things they think they're trying, they have to, they have to accomplish, they have to work up in their own strength before they get to Jesus. Don't make it difficult for them. Just let them trip over Jesus. Don't make them trip over all of these burdensome laws that we could never even keep ourselves in, in their repentance and in their turning to God. Let them trip over Christ and find their new walk in him. And James reduces 613 Mosaic laws down to three for the Gentiles. And what are the three? Abstain from food polluted by idols, abstain from sexual immorality, and abstain from the meat of strangled animals and from blood. And then he puts this phrase in here on that last one. Because Moses has been read, has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. That's kind of a funny tagline at the end of that last instruction. And I think it has to do with this. Abstain from eating strangled animals and blood. And I think I think the indicator here is that James is saying, not because those things in and of themselves are sinful, but because the, the truth of God has been proclaimed in every synagogue that has been dispersed throughout the known world. And th this is a tripping block for Jews coming to Christ. And so if you're living in a way and you're eating the meat of strangled animals and blood, not that it's sin for you, but you're, it's a stumbling block for Jews coming to Christ. I think that's the indicator that James is giving here when he says, because Moses has been taught and read. So this decision of James was grounded in prayer and in discussion, and in debate, and in the declaration of the Holy Spirit of God himself upon the Gentile believers, just as he had with the Jewish believers at Pentecost, and attested to by signs and wonders through the apostles. But I intentionally skipped a key element. Before James brought this final judgment, can you see what it is? What did we skip? Ooh, ooh, where was that? 13 in my book. 13. And after they 
Oh, yeah, when they finished speaking, they, James spoke up. Oh, I see. Yeah, they held it. That's good. I didn't even pick that one up. That's good. Right, they, they were silenced, right? The, by all this evidence that had been given to them, they, they were like, oh, I got nothing more to say. That's not actually where I was going, but that's great. Um, I actually, so, I've got to turn my page. So James listens to the declaration of Peter, sees the demonstrations of Paul and Barnabas, but before he makes this final determination, what does he do? He turns to Scripture to see if all these things line up with what God's Word has to say. Look at beginning in verse 15. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. As it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Other translations use the term, use the Hebrew term tabernacle. Return and rebuild David's fallen tabernacle. It, its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. So James listens to the testimony of Peter, of the Holy Spirit coming upon these Gentile believers just like he did with the Jewish believers at Pentecost. He listens to the testimonies of the demonstration of the Spirit's power throughout the Gentile world with Paul and Barnabas. But before he makes a binding decision for the church, he says, do these testimonies match up with what Scripture says? I would encourage us all to take on that pattern in our personal walks with Christ. We can hear testimonies from people. We can be encouraged by what uh, they say that the Lord has been doing in their lives and the lives of other people. And then open your word. Open your Bible, God's word. And see, does this match what scripture says? The words of the prophet, where is he quoting from? He's quoting from Amos chapter 9, verse 11. And he gives like this fine little three-point sermon. It's great. Uh, God declares, I will return, I will rebuild, and I will restore. I will return, God said. Where had God gone? What is he referring to here? Where did God go? That God himself says, I will return. They had forsaken him, right? And he removed himself. If you'll remember, Israel had grieved the spirit of God by their idolatry and their wickedness, and he removed his glory from their midst prior to the final exile. We see that in Ezekiel chapters 10, uh, or chapter 10, verses 18 and 19, we see this removal of God's spirit from the temple. He says, you have uh, grieved the spirit of God to the point where he is removing his um, tangible presence. Now, obviously, he's omnipresent, right? He's not removing his omnipresence. He's removing his tangible, uh, um, what's the word? Uh, Shekinah, thank you, that was the word I was searching for. His Shekinah glory, his present, uh, tangible presence among humanity from their midst. And so God says, I will return. When did he return? In that way. At Pentecost, that's when he returned. Exactly. And this is what James is saying. This is when the Holy Spirit of God in his Shekinah glory returned was at Pentecost, both for the Jewish church and now we see him in the same way manifesting in the Gentile world. I will return. And James says, we just saw it. And I will rebuild. Rebuild. 
What did he say he would rebuild? Surely he was going to rebuild the magnificent temple of Solomon. Right? No. Well, then I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of Moses. Is that what he said? For years, I, I would read over this passage, and I just assumed in my head he was talking about the tabernacle of Moses. But that's clearly not what he says. I will rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David. What a strange phrase. What is he referring to? The tabernacle of David. We see it twice in Scripture. It's referenced in 2 Samuel 6 and in 1 Chronicles 15. The tabernacle of David. What was the tabernacle of David? Well, David uh, conquered uh, Jerusalem and became king over all of Israel. He was determined to bring the lost Ark of the Covenant back to God's people. It had been lost in battle under Saul, King Saul. And the first time they went to go get it, they sort of forgot how it was supposed to be done, right? It was a long way. They, instead of carrying it on the shoulders of the Levites, what did they do? They threw it up on an ox cart and said, oh, this will be way easier to get it back. We're going to FedEx it instead of lugging it all back on our shoulders, right? And so it hits a bump, and you remember Uzzah. Uh, put his hand up to steady it, and God strikes him dead for touching irreverently the Ark of the Covenant in a, in a fashion that was not prescribed in the law. This, and then David says, I am not bringing this thing into my house. Like, <laughs> this is, what are you doing, God? I'm not taking this back. So they, he leaves it for a while, right? And it goes to the, the home of Obed-Edom. And then Obed and his household start to get blessed because of the presence of God in his household. And David goes, hey, I want some of that. I don't know if he said it like that exactly. But he saw, he observed what was happening in the whole household of Obed. He said, we're going to go get that thing and we're going to bring it back to Jerusalem. And so this time they suddenly remembered, oh wait, there's a prescribed way to do this. And not only did he carry it the way it was supposed to be carried, but if you'll remember he shouldered it on the shoulders of the Levites and they sacrificed animals every six paces, it says in scripture. Can you imagine that? It's like 12 miles from Obed-Edom's place to Jerusalem. 12 miles every six paces sacrificing. That is a flow of blood. But what does David do with it? Do you remember? What does David do with the Ark of the Covenant? He essentially pitches it in his backyard. He doesn't put it in the tabernacle. The tabernacle at this time, uh, it's, it's an interesting study. If you, tr if you study the, the, uh, the journey of the tabernacle itself and then the journey of the Ark of the Covenant, they're not always in the same place at the same time. The intended place of the Ark of the Covenant is where? In the Holy of Holies within the tabernacle. But the tabernacle here in David's day uh, was in Bethel, I believe. Nope, the Ark was in Bethel. Um, the... The tabernacle was perhaps at this time in Shiloh, I think. Um, but he brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And he essentially pitches it in his backyard. And it says, David worshipped before the presence of the Lord with music and singing and burnt offerings. And then he appointed Levites to continually worship before the Ark. This is not the prescribed way. The proper place for the Ark of the Covenant of God's presence was in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle of Moses, not in the king's backyard. It was not lawful for the king to assume the role of the priest. But David dons the linen ephod 
of the Levites when he brings it back. It says he worships before the presence of the Lord. His, he sacrifices burnt offerings and peace offerings. These are all roles of the priest. He's the king. Do you remember what happened to Saul when he did that? What happened? The kingdom was stripped away from Saul. He didn't wait for God's anointed, the prophet, to come and make the sacrifice. Saul lost the kingship because of this. Remember King Uzziah, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, begins with, uh, in the day that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. How did Uzziah die? Well, it doesn't say he died of leprosy, but it does say he died with leprosy. He had leprosy until the day he died. Why? Because he offered incense offerings like a priest should have. This is peculiar. David's doing the same thing. It was not lawful for anyone other than the high priest and that once a year to minister before the Lord's presence on the Ark of the Covenant. But David appoints Levites to minister before the Ark continually. Continually. And this is what Amos says, speaking God's words, that God says, I will return and I will restore the tabernacle of David. Not of Moses, not the temple of Solomon, the tabernacle of David. A very peculiar prophecy. And I will restore And this restoration speaks of relationship. It is not the structure of David's tabernacle that is rebuilt, clearly. Because James says, we are witnessing what Amos prophesied, the rebuilding of David's tabernacle. God is restoring relationship with every human being. It's not the structure of David's tabernacle that he's concerned about. It's the practice of his presence. It's not the letter of the law. It's the practice of his presence. Now that draws us right back into Acts 15, right? It's not the letter of the Mosaic law that we are to saddle the Gentile believers with. It is the practice, the ongoing practice of his presence. James says this is what has come at Pentecost. This is what they are seeing restored in the Gentile believers. The presence of God has come to your backyard. And we are now kings and priests unto his name. We have the privilege to engage the person and the purposes of God in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit and minister before the presence of the Lord continually. Why? Because Jesus Christ has paid the price for your sins and for mine with his own blood. He died and rose again by the power of the Spirit and he poured out that same Holy Spirit on both Jew and Gentile alike to equip you with the power to live a righteous life and the gifts to accomplish his purposes and call for you. So James says, don't saddle them with the whole law. These three things, right? These three things. Abstain from food polluted by idols, abstain from sexual immorality, and abstain from the meat of strangled animals and from blood. And then he closes. They write that letter and they send it to him. Let's skip ahead for time's sake to verse 30 as we close here. The men were sent off and went down to Antioch. 
where they gathered the church and they delivered this letter. And how did the Gentiles respond? The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the brothers with a blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. Well, I wonder this day if where we are in chapter 15 personally Do you have on your rearview mirror, there is no distinction between them and us. It's so easy to fall into the same trappings as our brother Pharisee here, who associates himself more with his party than he does with the purposes of Christ. But the reminder for us today is there is no distinction between them and us. We're all saved the same way. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all are in desperate need of his daily intervention in our lives. Are you seeing the demonstration of the power of the Spirit of God at work in your life? If you look back over the last year or five years or 10 years, you say, I'm pretty much the same as I was a decade ago. Or do you see the progression and the the power of God through his Holy Spirit and his refining work at work in your heart and life? Are you seeing miraculous things happen? When you're praying for healing for people, are, are people getting healed? When you're praying for people for salvation, speaking to people about new life in Christ, are you seeing the transformational power of the Spirit at work? That's Paul and Barnabas' testimony of what God was at work in their day and age. And remember, our study in the book of Acts is not just past history, but it's the present reality for God's people, even today. And then James's decision. We all have to make this decision. Let's not make it difficult for unbelievers to come to Christ. Now, how do I do that? Not by putting out 613 uh, you know, Levitical laws that you have to follow to come to Christ, but I have subtle ways of doing that, of making it difficult for people to come to Christ. I had a, we had a dear friend one time when I was in doing college ministry. Uh, after our worship services and prayer times, we would always go to um, Country Kitchen. It was the only thing open uh, in that little town uh, after, at that late hour. So we'd go there, and a friend of ours who would come frequently, she was a uh, waitress there. And that was back in the day, this will shock some of you, where they allowed people to smoke in a restaurant. Does anybody remember that? Maybe I'm just dating myself. Uh, so there was a smoking section and there was a non-smoking section. So she came over and was waiting on our table with a whole group of, of Christians who were there from, from the college ministry. And I just made a flippant comment. I, mean, I said, man, you must hate uh, having to s- serve in the smoking section. That must be really rough doing that all day long. And she goes, oh no, I would much rather do that. And that kind of shocked me. I said, why is that? She said, honestly, the worst crowd that comes in is the church crowd on Sundays. Wow. Why? Because they're belligerent and stubborn and cranky. And and she said, they don't leave a tip. (laughs) Cheap, right? Don't make it difficult for people to come to Christ. Like, through silly stuff like that. Don't be a jerk, right? These are barriers we put up to people coming to faith in Christ. Why? Because they associate my attitude 
with the person of Christ that I claim to follow. Because if that's what a Christian is, I don't want anything to do with it. Let's take James' advice. Don't be a jerk. Right? Like, don't make it difficult for people to come to Christ through our attitudes or our actions or our habits or our or the way we conduct business in our own businesses. That's a huge, a huge issue in the marketplace. How do believers conduct themselves in the marketplace? Like Christ or like a cutthroat business guy? Don't make it difficult. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. 